we look at it as a partnership too. It's not just us and we have investors. It is really a partnership. And I'll be honest, I've turned people away to invest in our fund because they're not a good fit for us. And oh, yeah. we want to be a good fit for you and the, and the investor, but we also want them to be a good fit for us. That's really important to us. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident investing beyond your backyard. And yes, I'm your host, Billy Keels, and I am really, 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 really fortunate because I get to welcome you back to another amazing conversation with another fantastic guest. Well, and you know what? Before I do that, man, you know, I like to talk about this kind of stuff. Thank you very much. We continue to move up the podcast ranking chart together. Thanks largely because you continue to download the episode, share the episodes with your family, with your friends. You're talking about it. It's awesome. Everybody's talking about long distance investing and it is the place to be. So thank you for being here. And also for those of you that continue to leave your honest written reviews as well as ratings, we really appreciate that. And if you haven't, we've got a short little video here specifically for the Apple podcast platform. Uh, so if you haven't done that, you've wanted to do it, you you hear, keep hearing me talking about it, go ahead and do it. Click the video and we'll make sure that, um, well, we understand what you like, what you don't like, things you'd like to change because I read every single one of them. So make sure that you have, if you haven't already done so, leave an honest written review as well as rating on the Apple Podcast platform. We'd really appreciate it. Secondly, for those of you that are looking for old episodes, go to billykeels.com. Once you're there, go to the podcast tab and you'll be able to find the audio version, the video version of every single episode we've ever done. Go to billykills.com. Once you get to the podcast tab, you can find it there. It would be awesome. And for those of you that still want to know about the accredited investor club, here's the thing. The process is pretty clear, but I only talk to you about if you're interested here, go ahead and send me an email. It literally comes directly to, well, not directly, but each one of them come to me. Uh, so send an email to aiclub at billykeels.com if you're interested. And then what I will do is you and I will have a conversation. I'll tell you more about the club, what it takes to be involved, all of these types of things, but there's kind of a little process to it. So first send an email. If you're just interested, or if you've been listening to me and thinking, wow, man, I am interested, but I don't know. So, well, just Look, just send an email. You and I will have a conversation. I'll tell you more about it and it will be awesome. But if you have some issues with your taxes, your active income, I think it would be worth sending the email. Um, if you want to meet other really cool people that are accredited investors that are talking about and benefiting from the number of different opportunities we're investing in and or just having a, well, just sharing a mindset, I definitely would recommend that you send that email to aiclub at billykills.com so you and I can have a conversation. But anyway, listen. Aside from that, today's going to be another awesome conversation. We're going to talk about uh, one of the things that we've not talked a lot about here, which is private money lending. We're going to talk about some funds, different thing, types of funds. Also going to talk to you about a really cool place in the United States that not a lot of people are talking about, but a lot of people are moving to. And um, yeah, today's conversation with Heather Dreves is really, really awesome. And we're going to get to that conversation just after this. Are you looking for a way to get to long distance investing success, but not spending all the effort? You want to do it in a way that's much faster and it doesn't cause as much pain? Well, listen, I can save you all of that stress. Just go to billykills.com forward slash seven mistakes and you can pick up your free PDF to help you on your road to long distance investing success. Freedom. So you know what? If you want to find out more tips on how you can build wealth by long distance investing in the real estate market, then guess what? This is the conversation that you're gonna to wanna to listen to until the very last word. You know why? Because today's guest not only studied education at Eastern Washington University, she also had a, uh, a start of her career in the mortgage business. And I wanna hear more about that. And I'm sure that you do too. But listen, this is really, really awesome because she is an avid CrossFitter and mother of two. And today she's the director of funding as well as fund manager at Secured Investment Corporation. Gives me great pleasure to welcome to today's conversation, Heather Dreves. Heather, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. What an honor. <laughs> yeah, this is really, really awesome. Love the energy. Love what we were talking about before and absolutely positive that you are going to add so much value to the entire Growing Long family. And I know they're going to really, really enjoy today's conversation. So, uh, so I'm looking forward to getting into the conversation. And Heather, as you know, you're going to get two questions in the beginning. 
You're going to get three questions in the end. And then in the middle, like I'm, I'm absolutely positive. You're going to add lots of value. I just can't tell you which questions you're going to answer. Cause I don't know what the questions are yet. So, so I guess we should probably, we should probably get into the conversation. And, uh, if you can help us understand, well, where is it that you, that you live in the U S yeah. So I live in a town called Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, we are at the top of the state of Idaho. So Northern Idaho, um, not far from the Canadian border. And we're actually right next to a town called Spokane, Washington. So for you mm-hmm. basketball fans, Gonzaga basketball, go Zags. That's <laughs> our hometown. Uh, but yeah, we're in a beautiful part of the country um, in Northern Idaho. And Honestly, we, we like to tell people it's really terrible and there's lots of bears and mosquitoes, but nobody's listening to us because it, the secret is out of the bag. I think uh, last summer, Forbes uh, rated it top five in the country to move to. So um, beautiful country. If you're an avid outdoors person and you like to ski and boat in the summer, um, it's just a wonderful place to, to be, raise a family and just a, a great um, lifestyle. Well, that is absolutely phenomenal. I'm sure that those, uh, that Gonzaga had a little bit of something to do with it as well. And, um, yeah, when the secret's out, the secret's out. I understand that you're kind of getting invaded by lots and lots of people, but also I guess the great weather in the summertime and nice chilly nights in the winter also probably helps as well. So, (laughs) so appreciate you sharing that, Heather. Can you also help us with just kind of the second question? I love positivity and the going along family loves positivity as well. Would you be open to sharing, like, what's the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours? Yeah, I, I, this is just a great question and perfect timing for me because I have a client, I work with lots of clients and I I feel like my passion is to help them live the lifestyle that they want so that they can spend time with their families. You know, they're, they're passively investing in creating wealth and cash flow for themselves. And I had a, a gentleman that I've worked with for the last couple of years and He came to me from a referral and I didn't have a whole ton of background with him, but he recently sent in an email to our CEO and uh, come to find out he was in the commercial real estate business for years and very stressful job, um, had a lot of health issues because of it. He was having some challenges with his children because he wasn't home that often and decided to take a leap of faith and get out of the commercial real estate business. He had made a lot of money, saved it, and reached out to me to start investing this capital um, and giving him the ability to create cash flow so that he didn't have to go back to work full time. And he wrote this letter that just was really touching and just said, you know, our, our opportunities that we offer him to invest capital has given him his life back. And um, it it really kind of hit me because I think we, we get a little numb to it here at our company, you know, because we just deal with it on a daily. and, And I don't think, that we realize how much we affect people and change their lives, you know, and he, he went on to say that, you know, he has the ability to live the life that he wanted. He's closer with his kids because of it. And, uh, you know, it it just made me realize how, how much we affect people in their lives and, and, you know, give them ability to, to not have to go into an office every day to be able to passively invest and work smarter and not harder and put their capital capital to work for them. So that was just re, like just yesterday this happened. And, you know, it was good for my team to hear too, because I don't think they realize how much they affect other people's lives. Um, and so we have a saying here at our company um, that we work for our clients. You know, we get more of what we want by helping others get more of what they want is what we say. And our families and our clients come first. Yeah, just to have just that mindset in terms of family and clients first is something that's really, really special. When when you have someone that actually goes the the extra mile, I would say, to take time to communicate through whatever medium to this with the CEO of your company, that's one of those things that you're like, wow, okay, this has really been a positive impact in terms of what we've been able to do. Now, there's one thing that's the returns, but I just, I, even just from the very beginning of this conversation, I'm, I, it's, I want the going along family to hear what you said. You weren't talking about a financial return. You were talking about being able to spend more time with family and and being able to do the things that they wanted to be able to do. So I think sometimes we can get lost in the, you know, what's the return and this and that, but really mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it's what's the positive impact we're able to do and how are we using the time that we have on this earth 
that can can be the most positive thing. So thanks for sharing that with yeah. us because a lot of times it's just the little things that we see in the 24 hours and we forget sometimes to, to just reflect on on those positive impacts. So I appreciate that. And, yeah. and as I'm telling you that, Heather, I'm I also kind of in the back of my mind thinking, I hope she forgave me because in the beginning I kind of gave this like thing, like here's the thing. The Going Long family knows this about me because I give myself this really impossible task. And that mm-hmm. impossible task is trying to tell your awesome, amazing story in like three and a half seconds. <laughs> Never going to happen. <laughs> Never going to happen. So they forgive me forever, right? And so hopefully you will forgive me. But more importantly, can you help me, Heather? Can you actually tell your backstory in your yeah. own words? You can tell it however you want. Those are the rules here. The one thing that I would ask of you, though, while you're telling your backstory if you could please talk to us about some of the major decisions that you made to get to this point in your journey. You've already started uh, talking about the way that you're impacting other people's lives, but really the, the decisions that you made to get to this point in your journey. And then we'll see where you and I take the conversation from there. Absolutely. Well, it's kind of my, my background is interesting because I, I had no background in mortgage or private money or passive investing. And, you know, I, I don't think things happen by chance. You know, mm. I think someone bigger than us has, has a path for us. Um, and, you know, to roll, roll my story back, you know, we have a, we have a 24 year old son and a almost 22 year old son. And when we decided to have children, it was important for us to be home with our kids. And we made sacrifices. My husband was running a a small business that we were in the process of purchasing. And I stayed home with our children and, um, we met playing college soccer, so we're big soccer fans. And um, we, when my kids got into elementary school, I decided I was going to go back into the workforce. I had went to college to be a teacher, um, but I had a niche for sales <laughs> and realized very quickly that I could make more money and, and was more satisfied in a sales position. And I had a friend that was in the private money industry. And we had worked together years ago, um, selling furniture of all things when I was like 20 years old. And uh, he says, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm in the private money industry. I'm a loan officer. You know, there's a ton of opportunity. You should come work for me. And I thought, what is private money? I had a mortgage on my house, but I had no idea about the industry. So long story short, I went to work for him and um, realized very quickly that I had a passion for working with investors and um, decided that I was going to get my securities license. And all this kind of happened at a perfect time. My husband and I were were purchasing this, this small business, which was actually an indoor soccer facility of all things. And the deal went sideways. And at overnight, he was out of a job. Um, the owner decided not to move forward with the sale to us. Um, at the time, it was awful, but a blessing. Now that we look back at it, like our path would not have gone this direction had that not happened. Um, I quickly decided I was going to get my securities license so I could start raising capital. Um, found a huge passion for it. I loved working with investors, creating cash flow for them, and and found that I had kind of a, a knack for it. Um and, and had that not happened with the indoor soccer center, we would have never gone this route. I also discovered the opportunity in investing in real estate through private money. You know, I think growing up, my parents invested in real estate, but they would always get traditional financing, you know, and I saw the limitations with that, but my eyes were opened with private money. It was like, mm-hmm. okay, so what you're saying is I can find a good deal and there's people out there that want to deploy capital into these projects and we started buying rentals. We started flipping houses. Um, we got our kids involved. We'd have them trash out the houses. They did a lot of complaining, but they liked it when they got paid. Um, but, you know, just found that, you know, not only was it satisfying to work with clients that I was helping invest capital, but the opportunity that it opened up for my family, you know, and being able to invest in more real estate projects because I had access to private money was just eye-opening for me. And um, I went through the 2008 market crash and I swore I was getting out of private money. I I stayed in it for a couple, probably two or three years cleaning up this portfolio. I felt an obligation to my clients and was getting out of it. And our CEO, Lee Arnold, recruited me. I think I told him no four times. (laughs) Um, And he's a very good salesperson. (laughs) 
And 10 years later, here I am. And, you know, like I said, we have had the ability as a family to create wealth for ourselves, buying investment properties. We have a few rentals we hold. We flip houses. Um, we now passively invest our capital. And um, the rest is kind of the end of the story. I mean, um, I, I see opportunity for myself and my family, but I also see, see opportunity to help others have the lifestyle that they want. Um, and I feel like we've taught our kids too. Our oldest son is a fireman, um, which is, you know, just, you know, we're super proud of him, but he also sees that he has the ability to do other things on the side. Yeah. And our younger son is still in college playing soccer, but he sees the opportunity in real estate. And, you know, I, I feel like enough people don't understand that they have to have multiple streams of income. You're we're not going to be able to have the lifestyle that you want having your day job. You have to have these other things going on. And I, if all I did was teach my kids that, then I've accomplished my goals. Wow. You said a lot there. There's a lot and there's a, you know, but, and if I think about the thing that you just said at the end, and I'm sure that a lot of the, the going along family and regardless of what they're doing, I mean, there's some people that are listening to us while they're in the car and there are other people that are jogging stuff. But when you think about the impact right? That you can have on those that look up to you. In this case, you're, you're talking about your children. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those things that you start to realize life is not just about money. It really isn't. It's about the impact that you can have on others, the positive impact and the lessons that you can, that you can share with them because ultimately it is about them being able to, you know, to have the, the, the freedom to do the things that they really want to do. And you're starting to see that manifest itself already. And your, and your oldest son, right, has a fireman who probably recognizes he has some additional time when he's doing, serving the community. He's, he's on and probably on for many, many hours. We've talked to other uh, firefighters that have been here on the show. And, um, and, and at the same time, he probably has some excess time that he could use to do other things. But ultimately, it's about not just the money, it's about what you can do and the freedom that it can create. So um, appreciate you sharing that as part of as part of your backstory. And also whenever you, anyone talks about soccer, I was like, man, I, I'm a guy from Columbus, Ohio, and I live in Barcelona, Spain, and I've seen like the most amazing soccer uh, over <laughs> many know, years. Over the last couple, jealous of you. <laughs> yeah, over the last couple of years. So I could probably talk to a lot, or I'm sure you would teach me a lot, but also talk to him for hours about soccer. <laughs> Um, so one of the things that you said, Heather, and you actually said it multiple times and for someone who started in education, but recognized inside of yourself that you had this desire for sales and there are a lot of salespeople listening and watching us. Cause I spent 26 years in the sales environment. So that's mm -hmm. probably has something to do with it with a lot of high wage earners. Um, but you know what, you, you mentioned that you love working with investors. Now, someone who's an educator that loves being in the sales environment, working with investors, like how in the world or why in the world did you, rec how did you recognize that you loved it working with investors? What was it? You know, I, I, I think just by falling into it for, by chance um, and, and just seeing, you know, really the satisfaction that they got with the capital that they were receiving, you know, the cash flow. I mean, most of my clients are retired or they were self-employed and they sold a business and they're at the point in their life where they're saying, okay, I have to replace that income, but I don't want to have to tap into the capital that I've preserved. Um, you know, and a lot of them are very focused around legacy wealth. You know, they're, they're trying to set their families up, whether they're setting up a family trust or some of them set up small family offices. Um, because I think, you know, this world is crazy right now. Even our oldest son is like, how on earth am I ever going to afford to buy a house? And it's not that I'm saying you need to be able to hand those things to your kids. I mean, we make our kids work for the things that they have. But being able to set them up for success, and a lot of my clients have done that for themselves and their families through the passive income that they create investing. And I, I think people in the past have historically thought, I need to get with a money manager and a financial advisor, and there's nothing outside of that traditional world. Mm. And I'm not saying, I'm not here to, you know, advocate for everybody to leave their financial advisor. That's not what I'm saying, but I do think there's opportunity outside of that. And I don't know that enough people understand about that, the alternative passive investment opportunities. And I feel like because I can educate people about that, it's very satisfying for me. Um, I love kids. I don't know that I was necessarily ready to be in a room full of kids all day as a teacher. My sister's a teacher. 
And there's a place in heaven for her because I don't know how she does it. <laughs> You know, I think you just as you as you grow older and you kind of have these these roadblocks and you go these different paths, you kind of figure out, hey, I'm actually kind of good at this. And and so I think for me to answer your original question, it's just the satisfaction that I get that I'm helping people. Mm -hmm. Um, Not that that wouldn't have happened as a teacher, but it's just a different clientele, I guess. So. Yeah. And so being able to recognize that you, that you like being able to add value to others and you can do it in a number of different capacities. You know, it's interesting you, you, as you were talking about the, the, the children and, um, in the financial advisors, which most people think that have, like they would never go together. But, um, it, so one of the things that I start realizing is yes, and I'm not anti-financial advisor either. Like there are a lot of uh, financial advisors that, mm-hmm. that, that work on doing the right things. And, but at the same time, I guess the, what came to my mind is I'm thinking, well, lots of times, there is the financial advisor who could be the person like you have two children, right? So can you imagine when you, right, when you had your first child that you gave your first child to someone else um, and decided, hey, listen, well, you know what? Uh, I'm not going to tell you what to do with the child, but I'll see you in about 18 or maybe 40 Mm -hmm. years and I'll get my child. And at the end of that 40 years, assuming that well, even though you didn't really give any direction to what you wanted to happen with your child, that things would come out in the way that you wanted 40 years later. Um, the answer to that is probably, probably not, but so many people will actually abdicate the raising of their probably most, one of their most important things, which is that, that some of the assets that they have to a financial, um, financial advisor without really giving much thought to what they do. Um, now you probably would want to, if you could, well, have as much influence over the way that you raise your children and, at the same time, it's okay to leave your child sometimes with a uh, with a with a babysitter, but you mm-hmm. probably want to take on that responsibility as much as you can, right. um, in in that kind of light. So I, it's always interesting when I hear people say that, well, financial advisors, you shouldn't do it. Well, that doesn't mean no, but there's just you want to be able to give the right direction uh, as much as possible in the same way that you want to be able to manage your assets. And, and uh, the financial advisor has a specific role, but don't let that person be the one that actually goes and really is in charge of your financial life. You know, I think when sometimes people talk about it or think about it that way, I don't know if that resonates and hopefully that kind of came out clearly, but, um, that was, I was just thinking about that. Yeah. And I think that so many more people this day and age are becoming educated themselves yeah, about it. Um, definitely. You know, people are learning about how to utilize self-directed IRAs and 401ks. Uh, I would say 90% of our clients that invest with us use some kind of tax deferred account. We're very familiar with them. That's kind of our expertise, you know, and and just for clarification, I'm not a tax expert. I'm not an attorney or a financial advisor. But what I can tell you is the, the education I've received just working with clients that use those types of accounts and seeing you know, how to, how to better tax plan, especially for people that, you know, are in a tax bracket where they don't really need the cash flow, but they want to grow those accounts and they should be able to. There's tons of opportunity with that. Our funds are friendly to those types of accounts. But um, my point is a lot of those custodians out there put on um, educational webinars about it. And I just think people are trying to take their financial you know, freedom in their own hands and, yeah. and, and are realizing and becoming more educated that there are other options out there. And so we love to be able to provide those types of options. Well, which is fantastic. Wow. Don't you just love this conversation? This is amazing. This is fantastic. And so just really quickly, I just wanted to remind you, for those of you that are looking to create more options for yourself, get there faster and do that with long distance investing, make sure that you go to billykeels.com forward slash seven mistakes to avoid so that you can avoid all those mistakes, get to your goals faster and sooner. Once again, that's billykeels.com forward slash seven mistakes to avoid. Now back to the conversation. There's one thing that we've not really spent a lot of time talking about, Heather, and that is the whole private lending aspect. So I would I would love for you to kind of give us a one-on-one class on that. But before we even do that, like one of the things that I'm always interested in is this whole concept of long distance investing and you can live wherever you want and and you be able to, you know, invest where it makes the most sense for you, for your family, for your objectives, whatever the case may be. And so I know that in terms of 
Idaho, for instance, it's like one of the states that I will go visit. I still haven't been there. And I know that there are probably a lot of people that are part of the going long family. who have got a lot of, um, of accredited investors that are thinking about, well, you know, I want to invest here. I want to invest there. And, mm-hmm. and maybe they've wanted to know a little bit more about kind of the Idaho area or Northern Idaho. Maybe you could talk to people, just give us a really high level understanding of like, what are some of the different drivers and some of the reasons that uh, people continue to invest if it's in that area or um, just to help to educate us a little bit high level? Yeah, well, um, first for clarification, the real estate funds that we have available to invest in, we do diversify those funds. And, and you're right. I think people in the past have always thought, well, I have to invest in real estate in my backyard, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I do agree with that to some extent, you know, in the event that you're going to have to take a property back or manage a rehab unless you have a team under you like we do. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think that there's opportunity to invest in funds like what we do because we have boots on the ground here, Right. And why not be able to reap the rewards and benefits and profits of a fund like ours? And we have the massive team behind us and you don't have to do anything. And I think that's where real estate funds have really opened up a lot of doors because now you don't have to be in that local market. As long as you're working with a good operator and they're, you know, accountable, they're doing, you know, the due diligence compliance uh, things that they should, they're an audited fund it just opens up so many doors. Our funds are diversified. So we take a large portion of our fund and we buy real estate in our local market. I mean, I have an acquisition team. I have a contracting crew here locally. You don't have to manage all that stuff. And all those profits from those projects go back through the fund and are paid out to our investors. We take a management fee and we share in profit above the prep rate. Um, The other large portion of our fund, we lend money out. So you know, there's only so many projects that you can do, you know, even with a team like ours. So we diversify it and we lend the money out to other real estate investors so that they can go have boots on the ground and do it. And then there's other profit coming into it. So, you know, like I said, I think in the past, a lot of people have thought, well, I need to be in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho to buy real estate there and to manage a, a rehab project or to manage a rental. That is not the case anymore. What you need to do is find a good operator. And once you find that good operator, you know, there's, it opens up so many doors for other options for investments. Yeah. Which, which is absolutely perfect. And so this is very much in line, which could, because here, as we're, as we're listening, it's a matter of saying, okay, well, there, we always talk about, or I always talk about four things, right? Number one, you need to be very clear on what's the benefit that you're looking for. So personally, what is the benefit that you want to come out of investing more of your time and eventually your capital? Once you're crystal clear on why you want to do that, then it's about finding the location, which gives you the highest probability of actually being able to achieve that that benefit. Mm-hmm. And then once you do that, and absolutely aligned to what you're talking about. The third point, and it's the most critical in my opinion, it's making sure that you have the team in the location or and or understands the location with their own team in that location, because that's going to give you the highest probability once again, because they're the ones that are there day to day of getting you to the goal that you want to get to. And so then a lot of what you're talking about as it relates to the funds is the fourth step, which is really once the first three steps are aligned, then the opportunity, it kind of, it, not that it doesn't matter, but as long as you know, you're the, the opportunity is going to align with what the team knows how to manage on a day-to-day basis. Mm-hmm. And that's in the location that gives you the highest probability of getting the goal that you want, then it, like everything is in alignment. And so you have right. a much higher probability of getting the ultimate outcome or benefit that you're looking for. So coming back to the point when you're, when you're, you just, I mean, you hit the nail on the head right from the very beginning, but that person today that's thinking, okay, well, this is, this fund is here. And, and I know in just a second, uh, Heather's going to tell us a little bit more about the private lending part, but I actually like Idaho or I kind of liked a, a little bit, but just to maybe help that person, not that they're going to go there themselves because they're investing with the team, but sometimes people also want to just invest in an area and it's not necessarily because of the financial return. Yeah. And you know, one of the things I stress to my team is, I really feel like people are investing in us. The assets are one thing and and that is important. I love those those four points you talked about because I talk with my clients like, what are you trying to accomplish? Do you want cash flow? Do you want growth? You know, you need to figure that out because they'll they'll be in 
analysis paralysis if they don't identify those things. Yep. But I tell my team all the time, I'm like, people are investing in us and the team that we've built here more so than they are the actual asset. I think the asset is one of the things that, you know, determines whether they're interested in us or not, you know, just based off of their four you know, questions they're asking themselves, yeah. but really they're investing in us and our expertise and our ability to be a good operator, manage the fund, find the, you know, it's, it's us. And people tell us that all the time. Like we love the fund, but we love your team even more because you communicate, you're responsive, you know, you are in compliance, you're a good operator. So um, that's one of the things too, is we look at it as a partnership too. It's not just us and we have investors. It is really a partnership. And I'll be honest, I've turned people away to invest in our fund because they're not a good fit for us. And oh, yeah. we want to be a good fit for you and the, and the investor, but we also want them to be a good fit for us. So um, that's really important to us. Yeah, no, and I completely hear you. And I've been in that same situation where you're kind of like, yeah, it doesn't really matter the amount of capital you want to place here. It's not it doesn't feel thing. like it's going to be a good outcome for either the two of us. And, you know, let's call it a day and, you know, you be happy <laughs> and I will be happy. <laughs> Just kind of move on to the next thing. Um, so, so a couple of things. So you've, you've hit on a number of different points, but I, I, you know, I, before, before we get out of here, like you oh. have to please talk to us about the private lending aspect. So a lot of people are probably hearing you, but then they're thinking, wait, hang on a second, private lending. What do you mean by that? How does that actually work? Can you give us like a basic 101 mm -hmm. for those people who may not be familiar with what you're talking Absolutely. about? Yep. So private lending is really just lending options outside of your traditional bank sources, right? Um, what we focus around is we lend money to real estate investors. So that means that they can't be living in the house. They cannot be an owner occupied property. Their kids can't live there. Our borrowers are clients that are buying properties or refinancing investment properties. So typically private lending is short term. Um, our average loan term is 12 months, and we will provide funding to real estate investors, again, that are purchasing or refinancing investment properties. The benefit to private lending is we're much quicker than a bank. Um, we have much better imagination, meaning we can look at a property and understand that the property may be worth more money once value is added, meaning once they rehab that house, we can base our, we can back into our loan based off of that, what we call an after repair value. Mm -hmm. um, most banks don't do that. They're going to lend you on the pro lend on the property based off of an as is value. Um, one of the strategies we teach our clients is buy distressed houses, buy the ugliest house on the street. Don't buy off the, the MLS market, you know, find distressed sellers, distressed properties. And so I think banks get very itchy when they look at those types of properties, but we, we see the vision and we see what opportunity is there providing they rehab it, you know, get it into better condition. And some of them put tenants in it. Um, some of them sell them, but really private money is just funding sources outside of your more traditional banks. Um, our clients that, that rehab houses and put tenants in it, then they'll go to the bank and get better terms, you know, better rates um, so that the property's cash flow, but we can help provide them the funding so that they can buy the property, rehab it and get it stabilized. So we're just a lot more creative. Um, banks are very restrictive. You know, they're going to limit you to how many you can have financed, you know, what the values are. And so we're really just an untraditional source of funding for real estate investors is really what we do. And we focus specifically around single family up to four units. So okay. we're a residential private money lender. We don't do apartment complexes or storage units. We focus around the residential space. Okay. And that makes sense. And typically it's probably, like you said, these are the types of uh, the types of opportunities where maybe it's a little bit shorter time frame. There's a need mm -hmm. for speed versus a lengthy a lengthy process. And also for those individuals that want to understand a little bit more, would it be fair to say because you're providing that type of service much faster, typically you're going to get in, involved in what the banks may perceive as much more risky type of opportunities that someone should expect on the other side to not compare the service that you offer to the type of service in terms of the rates that yes. they may see from a bank. Yes. Because would that be fair? That's fair. Yes. You're going to okay. see higher rates, but like I tell people, 
it's a cost of doing business. So yeah, our sure. very experienced borrowers, they work those numbers into it. Yeah. And they're short term. What you have to realize too, is they're not keeping these loans for 30 years. You know, right. most, I'd say on average, our, our really experienced borrowers keep these loans for four to six months. They're in and out of them as quick as they can. Um, and so it is a cost of doing business. And, and I think some of my, my more traditional investors get a little bit of sticker shock. They're like, why would someone pay that? But we can move quick. So we could get a yeah. deal closed in two weeks where that investor might not be able to buy that house because it takes too long going through a bank. You know, So they're willing to pay a little bit more for their capital Correct. to get the deal, buy it, rehab it, and move on. Right. And this is part of where I, I, I mean, you're definitely helping here, the going along family to understand it, there are different tools for different roles for different yeah. jobs. Right. And so this is just another tool, Heather, as you were explaining it, I mean, you explained it brilliantly that this situation it's, you can look at the specific tool that's going to help this um, perceived, maybe higher risk, shorter time frame where you may not be able to go to a bank probably because it takes them much longer and they are only working with certain types of boxes to be checked. If it's outside of those boxes, you're going to have to go somewhere else. So when you're providing the type of service that can help that individual, then, you know, these are, these are what these types of tools cost. So, um, or, or cost or investment, however you want to look at it in order to get the outcome that you're looking for. So I appreciate you uh, sharing that, but actually, you know, just really quickly, could you talk to us maybe a little bit about what the process looks like when you are actually working with um, potential new investors or the people that you've worked best with? Yeah. I mean, um, I kind of touched on it, but usually what I'll do is, is better understand what they're trying to accomplish. You know, what is your goal? Some of them want cash flow. Um, some of them are looking for growth in their accounts and some are active investors looking, you know, to, to obtain funding. Um, for my clients that are looking for cash flow, like I mentioned, the funds are a great option for that. They pay out earnings on a quarterly basis. But for my clients that don't necessarily need the cash flow, but are trying to just grow those accounts as quick and as big as they can, our funds actually accommodate them reinvesting their earnings. So now they're compounding their earnings, which is a great tool. Um, so, so really figuring out what they're trying to accomplish and then really understanding how risk adverse they are, you know, because we have the funds and they are a very passive way to invest they essentially don't have to do anything, but they reap the benefits of the profits of the fund. For my guys that are a little more risk adverse, we actually sell notes also. So we sell the lien against the property. I have a lot of clients that are really aggressive with those. You know, they're saying in their mind, they're saying, okay, I like the average yields of 10%, but this house that I'm lending money against has 30% equity in it. I like that upside even better. So really just understanding you know, who the client is, how, how aggressive and risk adverse they are, what they're trying to accomplish. And then I can back into suggesting things, um, you know, and, and a lot of our clients diversify. I mean, our funds pay average yields of 10%. On the notes side, if they're buying liens against properties, they're probably going to see 10 to 12, you know, but there, there's caveats that go along with that. Um, and then, you know, if they're an active real estate investor and they're out there buying the properties and rehabbing them, then obviously our options for funding would be the conversation that we would have, but just really getting to know the client. What are they trying to accomplish? You know, how, how risk adverse are they? And then we can suggest a product from there. And then we just work with them. You know, we're really transparent. Our funds are fully audited. So we provide them all that information. And, you know, once they're comfortable and they feel like it's a good fit for them, then we move forward helping them do that. All right. Fantastic. So I appreciate you explaining that process to us, uh, Heather. And, uh, and I know we'll get a chance to, in just a few minutes, talk to how the, how about the, in the going along family can get in touch with you and, and find out Absolutely. more. So, so we'll do that, but you know, I can't believe like we've been talking for a while because we kind of have to get to the going along final three. Like I get so enthralled in these conversations. I'm like, oh, I just want to keep talking <laughs> forever and ever, but time is limited. We can't, we can't. So the thing is, I'm not going to ask you to go along Final three, unless you tell me that you're ready. So are you ready? I'm ready. I thought you might be. I thought you might be. So here we go. So we started with you over in the northern part of Idaho, right there in the Canadian border. But I want to bring it back to this side of the pond because like my new adopted hometown and being over here in Europe and Barcelona specifically. So can you share with us, Heather, what is your favorite European city that you've either visited or still on your bucket list to visit? Okay. So this would be on my bucket list to visit. 
um, and it would be Hamburg, Germany. Uh, my husband's father was from Hamburg and he still has a lot of family there. And like I said, we're soccer fans. So we would love to start in Hamburg and then take a little tour. My uh, husband's favorite team is Manchester United. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're kind of a divided house. We've got Tottenham fans and Chelsea fans. So my husband's the guy that gets up at 5 a.m. to watch the English Premier League. He doesn't even watch you as soccer. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, right, well, I, won't, I won't make any comments about the MLS. I I don't blame him for waking up early. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't even watch it. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with uh, with Hamburg. So that will be uh, that will be your your place to visit. And um, yeah. well, the, the the soccer, as they let me say, soccer or football, whatever. Um, yeah. Over here, it's been a while. I've been over here for like twenty one <laughs> years, so it's these times get football. confusing sometimes. So yeah. So no, so that's awesome. But uh, going on to question number two, which is really about something that I've seen from a lot of very successful people. And I consider you to be someone that's very successful, Heather, as as well. And it's, it's really like one of the things that I've seen from successful people is they tend to do, well, one of the reasons that they're very successful is that they tend to do things right the first time that they do it. And then from there, they're able to like accelerate I just say that. I think I did. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's a joke. It's a joke. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't fear for me. Don't fear for me. I could see it in your face. I can tell you're like, oh my God, oh my God what God, is no. happening? <laughs> no, it's just a joke. Me and the going long family. Well, they all know they're laughing somewhere on a treadmill or cooking dinner or whatever. He got her, got her. No, so it, it's a joke. It's completely a joke. It's completely a joke because the reality is nobody gets things right the perfect, right. perfectly right the first time uh, and much less people that are very successful. The reality is, Heather, and whether you call it a, a learning opportunity or a mistake or whatever, people that are successful tend to do that like 20 to 50 times more than most people. That's just the reality. They make a lot more mistakes than most people. Also, another reality, and this is no joke, they do do one thing very, very differently. It's whenever there's a, like a major mistake that they've made or learning opportunity, whenever it's relevant to whatever they're trying to achieve, Without a doubt, every single time they stop, they learn from the mistake. And then what they do after that's amazing because they typically go out and put different strategies, tactics, and actions in place to minimize the probability of that exact same mistake happening again. Well, why? Because it was relevant. Mm -hmm. So I don't want you to think about the mistake. I don't want you, or if you call it learning opportunity, however, I don't want you to think about that. What I'd love for you to focus on is what's the one lesson that you know that the going long family needs to hear to minimize the probability of something negative or that same negative things happening to them? Yeah. Well, first of all, I tell my kids they're not learning if they're not making mistakes. Um, We look at those as as learning opportunities. Um, I would say that the one thing that I feel like was a great learning opportunity for my husband and I was the first house we rehabbed. We bought a house with a hole in the ceiling that had been there for probably three years. This part of the country, it snows. So as you can imagine, there was lots of organic growth inside of it. Um, My husband is very handy. He used to build homes back in the day. So we went into this thinking, we're going to rehab this house and we can do all this up to the point of hanging cabinets. And we did do it. We did. I mean, it was a full gut sheetrock. Um, it took us a year <laughs> and we barely broke even, uh, but it was a huge learning opportunity because what we realized is our time is valuable. And what you have to look at as a real estate investor is what is your value on your time? You know, is it in the best interest for me to be tiling a bathroom, which I very well could do, but in the time it takes me to tile a bathroom, I could be raising capital. So we realized very quickly that we were good at it, but it doesn't mean we need to be as hands-on as we were. And, yeah. you know, our holding cost ate up a lot of our profit, but honestly, it was a good thing that happened to us because we didn't lose money. We didn't make any money, but we realized very quickly that there was opportunity to make money doing that, but not yeah. with us yeah. being as hands-on as we were. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely love that. <laughs> so look for, look for the, the specialist. Don't be afraid to find someone who is, that's right. their expertise. And um, yes, I think a lot of times people undervalue the, what their own time is worth. 
Um, Absolutely. And so, yeah, I'm a recovering perfectionist. So that's one it's taken me a while to learn. Yeah, as that's, well, so. It was hard for us. Um, yeah. But surround yourself around people that are smarter than you that can do things better than you. That's it. That's it. That's yeah. it. Thank you for that. And then the third of the going along final three, and then uh, bring us, uh, bring us home. So it is help us understand what's the one book that you would recommend so we can feed the mind as well, please. Absolutely. Well, it's interesting. Our company has a book of the month club. So mm. we pay our employees $120 a month to read a book. And sometimes it's books we assign and some awesome. this month it's reader's choice. Okay. Um, but one of the books in the last six months that I've kind of been hung up on is atomic habits. Mm. Um, yeah. I'm, I don't know. Habits really intrigue me, whether they're good habits or bad habits. Yeah. Um, and until I read that, I didn't realize what a, a creature of habits I was. Like I literally do the same thing every morning. Um, and so it was pretty eye opening for me. There's some new habits I, I'm trying to create. Um, reading first thing in the morning, you know, not waiting till the evening, setting the tone. I don't get on my phone and look at emails and social awesome. media which is hard because it's part of this, this gig. Yep. Yeah. Um, but I realized how negative I just, the tone it set for the day. Um, and so just really being more aware of my habits and, and, and what habits I actually had. I didn't even, you know, I think we just kind of go through the day and you're kind of on autopilot. Um, but just recognizing those and recognizing how to set better habits and break bad habits. Um, that's been kind of my, my aha book for the last six months. All right. Atomic habits. So there's another one and we'll make sure that we include that in the show notes, which is awesome. So I appreciate you taking time to, uh, to answer those three questions. And I just go back to the beginning of this conversation. I'm like, man, these conversations just literally fly by. Like this is just that. unbelievable. So, <laughs> so here's the thing, like, and, and you're talking to us and you mentioned that, uh, as a, as a mother of two and you were uh, getting started and you, you, you wanted to actually get into sales. <laughs> it was really funny <laughs> that you went into selling furniture. I sold knives door to door, which was a whole different experience. We'll have to talk about that um, later on. That's admirable. Yeah, it was, well, that was a long, long time ago. I don't think you yeah. could do that nowadays, or I don't know how you do that nowadays, but, um, <laughs> but thank goodness I don't have to do that anymore, but it was a great, great learning ground. Um, but then ultimately you were able to get into real estate investing and you started recognizing that even though you started down the education path, you found that you had someone that recognized the skill set in you and you went forward with that and you recognize that you really enjoyed working with investors and a lot of things that you were learning from them and teaching them, you were then applying to your own life. And it wasn't just about being able to get the money, the capital. It was really about the things that you were able to do, spending more time with children, with friends. And, and as you start to see that and understand that and interacting with more investors and not only helping them achieve their goals. You're applying the same things in your own family. You've got a 22 year old son today who's uh, still playing soccer and a 24 year old son who's recognizing also that with the time, additional time he has that he can also be doing some other things. And so you're making impact with so many different people in so many different ways. And today, as you are uh, managing this fund and managing it across, uh, you know, different areas and different disciplines. I'm sure that there are people that are listening and thinking, wow, Heather really has got it going on. I love exactly what they're doing at Secured Investment Corporation. And you know what? They'd really love to know how they can connect with you and understand more about you. So could you help us out? Could you tell Absolutely. us what is the best way to get in touch with you, Heather? Yeah. So best way to get in touch with me would be go to our website. Uh, and that website is securedinvestmentcorp.com. Um, once they're on there, you know, they're going to be able to get a little bit of information about the real estate funds that I mentioned, and then also the notes, but they'll also be able to schedule an appointment with me, uh, and my team. There's three of us. So we're, we're a pretty tight knit team. Um, but we'd love to talk with people. You know, one of the things that I like people to know is we're, we're not trying to sell you something. We're really educators. And, you know, if, through educating you, you realize that the funds are a good option for you, then we can have that discussion. If you're not familiar with self-directed IRAs and 401ks, I feel like we're kind of experts at that. So we'd love to just have a conversation. Um, we'll do set up a 15-minute phone consultation. If we need to spend more time, absolutely, we can do that. But again, that website is securedinvestmentcorp.com. 
Fantastic. So go along, family, check it out. Uh, securedinvestmentcorp.com and um, let Heather and her team know, um, you know, when you make that call or when you sign up for that, uh, for that consultation that, well, you heard Heather and I speaking here on the Going Long podcast with Billy Kills. I know that would be helpful for Heather and her team uh, and also would be uh, appreciative from, uh, from me because that way we know that uh, our community is active, which is absolutely fantastic. So listen, Heather, you know what? I just really want to thank you uh, for deciding to invest your time with me and the entire Going Long family today. So thank you very, very much. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. All right. Awesome. And Heather, if you give me like 20 seconds just to just wrap up and say goodbye Absolutely. to the Going Long family or, or uh, hasta la proxima to the next time we meet. Um, so listen. Go along family. Wasn't it awesome? Like Heather just really gave you some new ideas. She helped to talk to you also about what the uh, private lending portion of things looks like, how that feels. And she's even given you the opportunity to reach out to her directly. So go ahead and take up her up on that and uh, apply the lessons that you're learning. Continue to talk about the podcast with your family, with your friends, get them to come on over and subscribe. Just click that button, which would be absolutely awesome. And I am looking forward to welcoming you back on the very next conversation. So until then, go out and make it a great day. And thank you very much. Wow. Don't you love hearing from top-notch experts in the field? You know, when I was getting started, I really wish that I would have had access to such experts. And even more, I wish they would have given me like a really simple list of things to follow so that I could have gotten to my goals much faster and been much happier even sooner. So that's why I've created for you the seven things that you should avoid in order to be successful in long distance investing. And you can pick that up really easily by going to billykeels.com forward slash seven things to avoid. And also, if you liked today's episode, don't forget to leave a five star review. I'm looking forward to seeing you on our very next episode. So go out and make it a great day.